this is Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong. Welcome to episode 24 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. It's been a fantastic week. We've got a lot of endorsements, a lot going on. We've got Jessica Salaji here. Maybe she'll endorse somebody. I don't know. Do you plan to endorse anyone tonight? Uh, not tonight, but I did endorse someone. You did? Oh, I saw that. I saw that you did endorse Brian Kemp. So, that's fantastic. And Matt Lowe is here. Yep, yep. Yep. We'll find out about his endorsements. But we're just going to dive right in here to the endorsements. Earlier last week, Casey Cagle was endorsed by Governor Nathan Deal. Um, And later on last week, Brian Kemp was endorsed by President Donald Trump. So... We have uh, dueling endorsements on the state and national level there, so that's that's quite exciting, quite exciting. What means well, more, Trump's endorsement or Deal's endorsement? I I think it's whether you agree with Trump or not, which I think that the three of us here have serious concerns with him, but it's pretty incredible to be endorsed by the President of the United States. Like, just that concept, I, I think it's a big deal, and I think it's way a much bigger deal than, you know, a soon to be has been governor who, you know, didn't really represent conservative values all that well. So I think Trump's is going to have more weight in the long run. And speaking of endorsements, and I'm going to let Matt tell this story, uh, but speaking of endorsements, one of our favorite legislators, uh, legislators here on the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast, uh, Paulette Rakestraw from House District 19. Um, her opponent, uh, Joseph Gullett, was endorsed by uh, the Paulding County Sheriff, Gary Gulledge, last week. And uh, then uh, some uh, shenanigans took place. And I'll, I'll let Matt Lowe take over from here since he's been following this a lot more closely than I have. Well, she, uh, the Cobb County Sheriff had who's Neil Warren, by the way, he had his, I don't know, like a 26th annual corn boiling. And it's it's some kind of thing. It's just a fundraiser. And it, uh, Jessica, do they do corn boilings in South Georgia? We don't. I've been to the corn boiling in Cobb, though. And I will say that if you've had 26 of anything, you've been in office too long. But carry on. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, he hasn't been in office for I don't know, but maybe he has been off. I think he, I think legitimately, I would have to research it to make sure, but I think legitimately he's been the sheriff for pretty close to 20 years. Yeah, I, I think so. Like cause Bill Hudson was the sheriff when I was, when I lived in Cobb, which was right. in my early 20s. Well, wow, that was a long time ago. Growing up and then all the way into my early 20s. That was before really? cable TV. <laughs> so it looks like, um, he was, he's been with the sheriff's office since 1977. He was chief That's criminal investigator. years. He's been chief investigator since 1984. So anyway, it was just, it was the, the corn boiling that they had. And somewhere towards the end of the night, uh, Paulette snuck in there, got a picture with Sheriff Warren. And then like first thing this morning, posts on, on her state house rep Facebook page that she was honored to have the endorsement of Cobb County Sheriff Neil Warren. And then like three hours later, it got changed. And I suspect that it's because he called her and said, you know, take that down. I didn't endorse you. It was just, it's very strange that, 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 that the edit happened the way that it did. So, so there's that. And in other news, uh, Jessica got stopped on the way home, causing us to be late for the podcast. And so to help her out with that and any issues that may come from that, we have constitutional lawyer Alex Johnson with us. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing, doing well. Doing well. Thank you. So uh, Jessica was stopped, uh, 60 in a 45, uh, was not ticketed though, so uh, I, I guess it was the uh, 
the, the positive effects of driving while blonde. So. I was gonna say, what was the what? So it was from a radar or something. They actually had a good reason for for the stop. Yes, this did not happen in Brooklyn, and you know, <laughs> all of the officers and sheriff's deputies in this community are even the state patrol. Like everyone, it's very friendly, and Brooklyn is definitely the norm. I mean, I got out of a ticket in Oak Park. So I'm not going to rag on the law enforcement. I was speeding. I deserve to be pulled over. The fact that you haven't been stopped for texting and driving yet is just astounding to me. I did have it on my lap the other day, and I was I was fearful. but Supporting it with a part of your body. I know. It's so dangerous. I'm going to get a ticket for that, like, inadvertently, because I'm just bad about like, I don't have anywhere good inside my truck to set my phone, especially if we've got coffee cups and things like that. So I'm real bad about holding it, and I'm, I'm going to get a ticket for it because I'm just holding it. I won't even be on it, but it'll be in my hand, and someone's, some jack leg is going to stop me for it. Yeah, driving through Cobb, that's a legitimate concern for you. So Man, uh, I go through. I go through. Leaving my house in the mornings and going to work, I go through Hiram, Powder Springs, Austell, and then unincorporated Cobb heading through Mableton to get over to Fulton Industrial on I-20. And you also cross through Douglas. Um, no, 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 no. No, because I take um, uh, Veterans Memorial to um, whatever that is. It's not Bankhead Highway. Oh, ah, okay. You don't cross over Thornton anymore. No, not anymore, man. 20, 20 between Thornton and Six Flags is entirely way too unpredictable. What we're here to talk about tonight, uh, to start with, is uh, is the Rainbow Family. We've been covering the Rainbow Family pretty heavily since uh, before it even started. We uh, we got some reports from some local reporters that there were some, you know, some civil rights violations going on, and that there were some you know, just outright crimes by law enforcement being committed as well as some vast police overreach. And so the Rainbow Gathering, you know, just to kind of catch everybody up, Matt was actually out there. He, you know, walked around, gave us a full report of what he saw. And now the Rainbow Gathering itself is over. It ended last week, but up in Lumpkin County, there are still a lot of legal issues going on. And Alex Johnson, who is here with us, is working with some of those legal issues. So, Alex, what what is, what, what's the status right now? I know that you've been involved. I know that Catherine Bernard has been involved. And I know that there's been a lot of people that, have they been denied bail or is it, just considered excessive bail? Where, where are we at on that? Well, um, yes, we've been working on it. Uh, today's some good news. I actually went up to Lumpkin County this morning, and uh, I think we got eight um, of the, the nine people that were on a calendar um, released on OR bonds, meaning that they, they're out on their own recognizance now. Um, it was a seemingly sudden hearing that was scheduled, but but uh, we managed to, to get them out. And uh, the judge up there was um, very, very nice in granting those bonds because, um, I mean, ultimately it's it costs a decent amount of money to keep peaceful people locked up in jail. And, and I mean, eight of them got out today, um, or at least assuming they processed within the past 10 hours. So sometimes sheriff's departments take a while. Hopefully they did not in Lumpkin. Um, but it, we, we believe people are out now. So that's that's a good thing. There's still some incarcerated. Um, and I mean, it's been it was bad from what the reports we've been hearing regarding the rights violations that were going on. I mean, roadblocks for looking for just general criminal activity have been unconstitutional for years. It sounds like that's what was going on. Um, the holding people without bringing them in front of a judge is is not allowed in this country and they it seems like that may have been happening um, there are a whole bunch of civil issues that are there regarding their civil rights but right now we're just focused on trying to get people out of out of jail um since that it, it, it sucks to be in jail 
So did one us. of so did one of the um, people up there call you, or were you familiar with what was going on, or how did you end up involved in this soon to be national story? Yeah, well, I I I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how I heard about it. I think the first thing I saw was probably a Facebook post about roadblocks, and and it it may have been been one of you that posted it. I'm not sure, but I saw that before, like somewhat early on before the gathering, and then I I received a phone call from from a, somebody up in the Lumpkin area who who mentioned to me that that this stuff was going on, and then then uh Catherine and I got brought into it, um to to try to, you know, help people and stop the rights violations of now. And, and apparently, um, the, the government's been harassing this group for years. Um, there, it hasn't been, I haven't seen the documentation in front of me personally, but it's, I've heard that they're, the federal government spends money just chasing them around, causing them problems, which isn't good for anybody. They have a team uh, <laughs> with the U.S. Forestry Service. They have a uh, a tag team that is dedicated to dealing with this rainbow family gathering on an annual basis. Um, when I was there, I, I heard a conversation between one of the, the family members and one, one of the other tag team guys where they were asking about officer, I can't remember his name now, I was like, Officer Smith, where's he at? You know, I don't, I haven't seen him this year. Oh, well, he, uh, he completed his degree and passed the bar. He's a lawyer now, you know, like they, they've interacted with his team enough over the years that they, they know some of these people's stories. Yeah. And that's, and that's, I mean, as an American, that's very concerning to me because I mean, why do you target a group based on their association? I mean, I think that's, that's probably violative of the First Amendment. I mean, the type of things that I've been hearing just seems as if various government officials took the Constitution and used it as a guide for things to, to just ignore and to violate of, of citizens' rights. It, it's actually appalling compared to what I, I mean, even I do civil rights litigation regularly and pay attention to this stuff. This just seemed appalling from everything I've heard. And I have no reason to believe that anybody's lying to me either. Right, Why, what, what do they have to gain from that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they just, I think they're just tired of getting harassed, which is scary. I know they did say, when I was up there, we asked them, almost everyone that, that we had a discussion with, you know, about their, if they had been to more than one gathering and what their thoughts were on law enforcement, the way that they handled it this year, and, and every single one of them said that like the heavy handedness of law enforcement was the worst that they'd ever seen. I know that there's a there's a Facebook group called Say What You Want Belong Ago. And uh I I've seen a whole lot on that page. I've uh, seen a whole lot of positive and a whole lot of negative. I've uh, I've seen comments on that ranging from a lot of support from people that have been out there, people posting pictures of the forest and the as the cleanup phase goes on, uh, all the way out to, I've seen people that have suggested that, uh, these people that are locked up right now should be hung in the town square. Nice. So yeah, it's, uh, it's classy to know that that's going on in the American, you know, conversation. 2018, yeah. we're still talking about hanging people in the, town square how how many people are we i know you said nine today how many people total are we talking about that are rainbow family people that are in jail right now do you know that off the top of your head off the top of my head i don't know the exact number but i know that that earlier on it was probably between 20 and 30 i know that right i think it was right after the the gathering um, we went up there to the jail and met with as many people as we could have in a day. We were there for maybe about 10 in the morning till 10, 1030 in the evening and, and met with a lot of people that were locked up. And, and I don't think we even got to everybody. But I think at that time, there were probably around 30, 20 to 30 that were in, in, still incarcerated. But that that doesn't mean that was it. And a lot more got 
got petty tickets from that were federal, not state, and others were were out on bonds. So it's um it's a lot of people, and it's it's hard to keep track of them all because a lot of people are um like the Rainbow Family is not like a an organization where they have a membership role. I mean, it's I think they're part of their their philosophy. I I believe is that they're they're all just voluntary participants that show up. So there is no centralized database. I mean, it, a lot of it is talking to people who say, oh yeah, another one of our, our brothers is in here. And then they, they let us know who that is. Right. What are we talk? Are we talking, you know, mostly pot? Are we talking traffic stuff? Cause I know that, you know, I know that one of the things in Georgia for, you know, people that don't know is, you know, pretty much anything that you can get a ticket for, you can go to jail for. Is that correct? Since I mean, pretty much everything's a misdemeanor. Yeah, everything in Georgia is considered a, a misdemeanor, um, but there are a, a lot of departments have different policies about the fact that, you know, if it's a minor traffic violation, usually they're, you're released on it with a citation. Um, but there there are some weird, I mean, I've, I saw some weird charges on the books. Like I saw one for tires um, as a charge. Um, I mean, they, they had things for windshield wipers and failure to have a uh, license. I mean, I think there's at least one person who had a failure to for failure to have ins failure to have proof of insurance, even though the computer showed them having insurance. Um, and it, it's one of those things where you know, a, a, most people just be like, "Go." In this case, they turn around and arrest them. I mean, since now insurance is electronic in Georgia, um, but there there's egregious cases where they had dogs alert on cars that didn't have any drugs in them and then had them unload the car and then left their stuff out on the side of the road or just invented something to arrest them for. I mean, it's, it's weird. I mean, it's and the, the worst charge I think I've seen would probably, I mean, I don't know. It did, there's, there, there were alleged DUIs, but ultimately most of these, I don't, I think the people are innocent. I mean, that's what it comes down to. I think that most of these are just invented charges to lock people up. So you also do a lot of, or I think you do some work um, with civil rights inside the prisons, right? Um, I have done some cases with that. Yeah, I mean, without I, getting into, I mean, I know you cover all kinds of things all over the state, but without getting into specifics, can you talk to us a little bit about what kinds of things you're seeing inside our prisons that warrant legal representation while they're on the inside? Well, I mean, the the things that would qualify for for you know civil rights type <laughs> claims are, um, I mean, Likely. yeah, there have been there have been abuses in the past. I mean, I've seen a guy get get pressure washed by guards before in a jail. Um, in some of the prisons, they, I mean, they're I've seen people held for too long. Um, if you don't get adequate medical care, I mean, the thing is, was that in in prisons, I mean, a lot of people would, I mean. I think falsely think that, you know, prisoners have a really nice, cushy life. I mean, a lot of times, like, they got to work, they, there's a lot of effort required to get basic medical care. Medical care isn't necessarily good. And constitutionally, they are not entitled to, to high class medical care. The way the right. standard generally works is that they're entitled to some sort of medical care for their, their issue, something appropriate. Um, and some places that's not happening. Um, and that that's a problem. If you aren't released on time, it's a problem. I mean, there's those are the main things in prisons where where I get involved is if there's clearly a rights violation where you know they should have been released, they should have been getting medical care. Um, but the government has a lot of latitude in the way they treat treat uh, convicted prisoners in in sure. state prisons. Well, and I'm really fascinated by because I don't really feel like the success rate of these types of cases is reflective of an attorney, just because like you said, they have a wide latitude in how they can treat people. I mean, we hear about it all the time and we see the public's reaction where the public's like, well, they deserve it and they shouldn't have broken the law and you know, they only need two meals a day. So, I mean, we've seen all of these things, but how do you feel about the actual justice side of the justice system when it comes to these? I mean, are there, do you see remedies? Do you see compensation? Or is it generally just trying to go through the motions to put pressure on these facilities to not do it in the past or in, I mean, in the future? Um, I mean, I think that, I mean, it, it's, 
from my perspective, it's it's both. I mean, I think that by getting sued, I mean, that, that puts pressure on them to not do it in the future. Because um, there are some fee shifting statutes and such where it makes it costly for them to violate people's rights. Um, but ultimately, the, the greatest problem is that the, the government has immunity from a lot of suits. And a lot of times judges make the call on whether or not a case can move forward. It makes it so that government isn't very accountable to the people. What? Are you kidding? I mean, it goes a lot. Yeah, I know. It's it's shocking, right? Shocked. Government's not being accountable. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's sad because it'd be an easy solution. I mean, if you could actually, for example, I mean, it, it's weird. Like if an officer does something wrong, like if you got pulled over today for absolutely no reason, the issue is that you can't sue the government entity that employs them. That isn't their fault, as long as their policy isn't mm -hmm. pulling over people for no reason. I mean, <laughs> you ultimately sue the officer. The county will probably pay for it. But there's this whole fictitious set of, of law that was made up by federal judges that said that you can't sue the, the county. You have to sue the individual. And they pretend like the county's not going to pay the bill. But uh, but suing them is a big deal because, honestly, because of how tough a lot of the cases are, there aren't that many attorneys that do civil rights claims in Georgia that I know of. I mean, I know of a good probably 30, 40 maybe statewide, and, and different, different people do different things. Some just aim for the big institutional changes. Personally, I like finding the individuals who have been wronged and specifically helping them just try to get some compensation for what they went through. Um, but... I mean, in a case like the Rainbow Gathering, I, I think that, you know, sometimes there's systemic issues that need to be addressed, maybe with the U.S. Forest Service if they're chasing people around the country. Well, and like you said, too, I mean, if you have to go through the process of, you know, petitioning a judge to allow a case to proceed, these aren't quick things. This isn't like when you have a traffic ticket or even a criminal charge where it moves rather swiftly through the system. I mean, these cases take years. Yes, I've waited. I've waited. I mean, I, I do. I do personal injury cases too, like car wrecks and such. Those often take times take about a year, year and a half to get to trial. I've just waited in a civil rights case, and I'm still waiting over a year to get an order back. Like the 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 government filed a motion trying to get the case thrown out. I responded, and it's been over a year since that was done. So the case has probably been going on for two to three years now. I mean, it, the turnaround time on civil rights claims is years and to, why is that is it because there's so many or is it just the way the system is well it's it's it, it's it's not because of the number it's because um because there are probably very few of them the issue is that um, in every case it, almost every case the government entity files a motion saying our officer has immunity because there hasn't been a clearly established case of this specific problem happening in the past that a judge has said is a problem and the judges can take that very narrowly or broadly. Like it's it's almost like saying that that you know since since someone didn't you know didn't reach for their right pocket instead of their left, and the cop shot them, and that was considered a rights violation by a judge. Therefore, you you can't do it when it's the other pocket. I mean, it's it, it's the judges can do it narrowly or broadly in throwing cases out. So it's in every case, it seems. The government wants to try to get the case thrown out on immunity grounds. So if you could alter the system or improve the system in the favor of the people and in favor of accountability and transparency, what would that look like? And and what would we I mean, do we need new judges? Do we need new what do we need? Well, I, I think that I think that everyone Everyone is working in the current system the way that it's designed by the politicians um, and by the, the Supreme Court. So ultimately what we need is we need either the we need legislators to either pass laws waiving immunity um, or we need the Supreme Court, which I think a ca the case is going right now where there a, a big group of people on the left and right sides of the political spectrum filed an amicus brief asking the Supreme Court to get rid of this this qualified immunity doctrine on civil rights claims because that that's really the problem. In an ideal system, if you're wronged by the government, like if, if you get pulled over for no reason, you get get beaten excessively, you get held for too long, 
I mean, the government should pay for it. The government should be the name defendant. They shouldn't have immunity and they should have to pay for it. Because right now there's a very odd situation where even if you're in front of a jury, some jurors might think that you're suing Officer Bob for, you know, wrongfully arresting you. And, you know, Officer Bob puts his life on the line every day. So we don't want to award a judgment against Officer Bob. But in reality, it's the county that's going to pay for the judgment and pay for the fact that you were locked up too long. Um, but people don't know that. And it's because of this weird doctrine that sort of hides the government from liability. Um, if that was gone, I think that governments would train their officers better, they'd pay their officers better, and that, that ultimately you would have a lot less rights violations because everyone would educate their people on, on civil rights. I mean, I, I've had officers tell me that, that I had one officer tell me that um, he could arrest someone for obstruction for refusing to talk to him during an investigation. Holy. And, uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I kept a straight face. It was in a deposition, but I've had, and I mean, the officer th thought he was doing the right thing. I mean, it wasn't like he, he, you know. I have a problem with the the Georgia obstruction code because it's, uh, the, the reality of it is, you know, you know, that the, that officer is not far off, you know, on that assessment that he can, you know, it, it's, uh, I mean, because yeah, I mean, you can't arrest somebody for not speaking to you if you're a law enforcement officer, but it is the way that obstruction code is written. It is so incredibly broad that there's not a lot that you can arrest for on that, under that code. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, just, and that's that's one of the problems. You see a lot of people getting like whenever I see charges for obstruction or disorderly conduct, especially if there's no other charge on there, I always think to myself like, oh, you must have just angered a, a an officer, which oftentimes is debatably a civil rights claim. I mean, you can't just arrest someone because they 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 made you mad, but a lot of times that's what happens, and depending on the sympathy of the victim, uh, they they can get away with it. It's insane some of the, you know, the way that some of the laws are written in this state. I, uh, I've i seen the weird ways that presence is defined and, you know, in cases of, you know, second and third degree cruelty to children where, you know, where you got some parents fighting and there's a kid in the house and, you know, the kid couldn't see it because the kid was in their room, but the kid could hear it. So you're being charged with third degree cruelty to children. I would think, though, that for something like that, there's something else that's going on. I mean, because folks fight, right? I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, they fist fight, but I mean, married couples argue, you know, and if you're charging somebody with, with you know, that because they were fighting in front of their kid where they could get here, they got caught out there for some other reason well you you can't you can't always say that because you know it's i have lived in situations in my life uh particularly in apartment situations yeah you're I, right I I, had, that is yeah. a very narrow point of view on my yeah so I, I don't know where you're going with this I, yeah, yeah i had i had an apartment where i had a lady above me that uh Every time that, like, here is the here is the perfect example. Okay, I'll tell you this story. I got in from work about three o'clock in the morning, and uh, my my wife at the time, ex wife now, she had to be somewhere about seven o'clock in the morning. Um, she didn't have any money for gas, so she woke me up about seven o'clock in the morning and asked me for. Twenty dollars for gas. I admit freely, I responded with a rude remark. It wasn't loud, but it was rude. So she said, "Okay, you know what?" Expletive and slammed the bedroom door. Went in the kitchen, started making coffee. Five minutes later, I heard that distinctive police knock on the door. And this was like the third or fourth time they'd been out there. Because th there had been three or four different instances where the lady above us had called the police about 
our behavior down there. And every bit of it was situations pretty similar to that. Nothing, you know, nothing ever like even a loud argument. Just, you know, closing doors too loud. She called one time because uh, my ex was was talking on the phone and it was like one o'clock in the morning. She was pacing the floor while she was talking on the phone and I, I wasn't even there. And, uh, and they, uh, came out there because they said that, uh, they were told that there was a wild party going on in our apartment. <laughs> so yeah, you, uh, when you're, when you're talking about matters of, of police involvement and calling the police, you can never discount the nosy neighbor is my point. So Alex, you're super political too. Like that's how we met was in the political circuit in Georgia. So yeah. do you feel like, I mean, it's, I think the part of people who are in the Liberty movement, what is so important is that we all have different issues and we all have different reasons for being a part of it. Um, and I think that those who are lawyers have like a big, a great advantage, like you and Catherine, both, you know, you're so well versed on the law, but what do you feel like is the biggest threat to our our civil rights if we're not behind bars? I mean, obviously that, that sets different parameters, but kind of getting back to what we were talking about, what is the biggest issue that is around politically that is affecting the people? That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that could probably take a book. Um, well, but I, we have an hour, so just talk as long as you like. Um, I, I think that that I would say it's it's probably a combination of apathy and 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 just this sort of like propaganda based fear immediacy of wanting to use power to go against against things you don't like. Because going back to um, for example the 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 both situations we just talked about both the um, and free law and the um and the people getting in, in people getting um the police getting called on you in your own home i mean one i don't think people realize that when you call law enforcement their job is generally to arrest people i've been told by officers before that well how am i going to know if someone's doing their job on the force if they aren't writing citations or arresting people. So people have this knee-jerk reaction e either towards their, their significant other or towards neighbors of, well, I want to solve this problem and I'm not going to go do it myself, so I'm going to call the police to do it. And then it, it, it creates a situation that extends into like the hands-free law. People are like, oh, well, I don't like people driving with cell phones in their hands, so let's make it illegal. Well, what does that lead to? Well, that means that, you know, if I'm holding a cell phone in my hand, like this is clearly a cell phone, right? But what if, from, but from a distance, how do you know that, you know, if I'm holding this, something in my hand driving, and it's a long ways away, I mean, these are M&Ms, but it's <laughs> my hand, you know? Like, we're, I'm driving along the road, I have something in my hand. This is, this is arguable probable cause for a police officer to stop me because of the hands-free law. Prior to this, they couldn't stop me for that. Now they could say, oh, well, we thought it was a cell phone. So just realize the amount of rights that are lost when police now have this cover for pulling over anybody they want. And I mean, you hear you hear issues all the time about, well, do police target certain certain demographics? I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but does this make it easier for them to target those demographics? Absolutely, because they can just say anybody, they're like, oh, I thought you had a cell phone in your hand, but oh, look, now I've searched your car and I see X, Y, and Z in there, or I found people with a warrant. I mean, it expands the scope of government so much, and politicians just don't get it. I saw, um, I think it was David, I think David yes. Stover posted. Hmm? Yes, I saw that. Yeah, David Stover posted something on Facebook saying how the hands-free law was stupid. And then I think another politician commented saying something like, oh, really? Like, you think this is bad? Like, why didn't you talk to anybody about it? And and I just was like, it, 
why should anyone have to be educating these politicians who claim to be for individual rights because they're Republicans and they're supposed to be for limited government to not pass dumb bills like the hands-free bill that, that lead to right violations? And I don't understand why the Democrats voted for it because it's just going to cause more police to pull over more people. Like it, it's, it's just, it's insane. That's one law that was passed that has done all of that, that you just spent the last minute explaining. That's one yeah. One thing. And most people think it's just, oh, well, it's going to stop people from, from driving recklessly on the roads. Well, guess what? Reckless driving was already a crime. I mean, right. somebody's not doing their job. It's the police, not, not, not the citizens. Like, we aren't the problem here. And speaking of the, the cell phone law, you know, I, I have all of the concerns that you've just expressed. But also a, a big concern that I have is this. Because I feel like that ultimately this is the path that we're on. That what's going to happen is that it's going to be, you know, that people are going to start getting these tickets. And the people with the means to do so are going to start taking these to jury trial just to prove a point. And then once these tickets start getting tossed because these officers can't prove it. They don't have any evidence. It's just their statements. You know, my concern is the next step here is some type of device that's going to automatically search your phone or um, allowing them to. Because I've already said I'm going straight to a jury trial. If I ever, I don't care if I'm guilty. I'm going to a jury trial on this cell phone thing just to make it an expensive endeavor. What is the law with with regard to that in terms of your phone being evidence on the side of the road? Because we have, you know, we have a few rogue police departments down here, a few. And when you get into the really rural areas and people have posted on Facebook like, oh, they're they're asking to see phones or they're taking phones on the roadside as evidence. And I don't know. I mean... Of course, I'm going to push back if that happens to me and they try to take my phone, but I don't know the law with regard to that as evidence. Give me your phone, Mr. Lowe. You're going to tase me and take it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I mean, ultimately, I mean, if they try to to take something as evidence, I mean, I mean, you could always just say you don't consent. But I mean, it it, it's interesting interactions with law enforcement like the law. The law is that people can resist unlawful arrests, period, from from anyone. But the issue, of course, is as a practical matter, if you try to resist police officers and end up, I mean, you'll end up. Dead end. That's dead. what people end up with. Yeah. So, so that, so that's the thing. I mean, obviously, like, just make make it clear you don't consent. But I, I would say that's a good reason to make sure you have a password on your phone, um, because that makes it harder for anybody to get into it. I know Apple, for example, has very. I'm an Android user myself, but Apple has some some good uh, protections, and they don't. They don't give law enforcement, at least last time I checked, they didn't give them cracks for the phones. But it has to be a password because. There is case law saying that they can compel you to use like fingerprints or they can always hold it up to your face or whatever else to unlock it, but they can't compel you to give a password like that. They can't force you to do that. I mean, it's against your right of self incriminate of not incriminating yourself. So what a mess. It is so ridiculous that we're even having this conversation and yeah. that I'm talking about what password I need to have on my phone so I can change the Pandora station while I'm driving. I mean, it's ridiculous. That's it's illegal. Ri- I know. But unless you do it by voice, apparently, or you do it on your watch. But yeah. I mean, that's how vague it is. I mean, you don't really know what's legal and what's not. Yeah. One I'm... law. One law did all that. Yep, you, exactly. you don't have the little. You don't have the Bluetooth connectivity into your radio. So I you do. Can change your Pandora station. Well, it doesn't always work correctly. I mean, it's technology. But you know, my thing about all this is. It's also like these lawmakers, when they put these things into effect, they damage the public relations with law enforcement, too, by putting this kind of garbage into law because they're going to enforce it. And then the people hate the cops and the cops. Yeah, they're enforcing it, but they didn't write it. I mean, it's just the whole thing is just no afterthought other than the campaign mailer. 
Yeah, they love the children. It's always for the children, you know? Like, it saves children's lives by doing that. I mean, the I saw an article in the AJC from the, I think, one of the people who was pushing it, talking about how um, she's not done fighting for even stricter laws because right. her her son, I think, died while getting, while, yes. while texting, while driving. And he texted for six minutes leading up to his accident. One of the other big cases that was pushed heavily in the legislature related to this was a fellow watching pornography while driving his 18-wheeler down the road. Well, that was actually pretty egregious. That was the one that killed the five Southern students. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's what I'm saying is that that's that's number one already illegal on on many, many fronts, all the way from, you know, you know, there's many crimes I can think of that would fall under that. And secondly, that that's not something that's happening routinely. At least, right. Lord, I hope not. I haven't no. seen it, but you know. If someone was doing that, I mean, the, and the thing is, is that ultimately it was already illegal to like weave weave across the road or drive recklessly or to speed and all these other laws that if an if an officer had been there, they could have stopped it. And I mean, officers can't be everywhere. We don't we don't I don't think we want them everywhere. Um, but I think that, that that's a sad thing is that the part of living in a free society is that bad things happen. And I mean, I, I think that, that people don't like that reality and that to answer your earlier question jessica i think that's probably the underlying danger is that people just think the government can protect them from everything and that's i mean that that is what will lead to the loss of many many rights right so what do you think about these elections coming up here on tuesday um well there have been some dueling endorsements recently for governor it seems um and uh, yeah, I, I, I wonder which is a bigger card in Georgia, a deal endorsement or a Trump endorsement? You know what I think about that? I think that the Trump endorsement is going to help more. And that is because there are people who pay such close attention to national level politics and totally discount local stuff, even state stuff, that likely until that tweet went out had no idea there was a primary runoff. And now they're going to go vote in it. You know, I, I, I think you're right. I think that there's, uh, I think that, you know, a lot of these people, because it it's, it's very, it's something that I've realized about myself, particularly since I've started doing this podcast, is that, you know, It's a difficult realization that I think everyone on this podcast, including Alex, has had that not everybody follows politics as closely as you do. Right. And it's, you know, and you get to this point where you realize that, you know, these things that you just do instinctively, you know, reading the local news, you know, following national news a bit. Honestly, you know, I follow more local news than I do national news. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing, these people that, you know, just turn on the cable news provider of their choice and watch the latest thing that Trump is up to, and that's all they know of politics. Right. right. So. And I have, have no idea of what Trump is up to. I, I did see something at the gym earlier. There was a TV on. Apparently, he went to Russia. That, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's the extent of my knowledge of, of national politics at this yeah. point. He he went to Russia is the most underselling of that story in the history of telling that story. Well, that's, that's the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> well, you know what's what's funny though is that that's the type of I mean that I wish we had more of that type of underselling of some of these these events than overselling them because it I think it breeds a false sense of knowledge in people when they hear like oh well Trump went there and said X Y Z well what did that like how did that actually change international relations and international policy? Did it actually change how much money we're spending on NATO? Did it change how much money was like our relations with neighboring countries? I mean, what actually happened? And I think that that it makes people think that whatever's on the news is is 100% reality when half the time it 
I mean, we all know how politics works. I mean, half of it's backroom deals. And that's not what I mean, that that's never actually let let out on the media. Right. Yeah. It's uh, you, you know, when, when you get close enough to politics, you quickly realize that what you're seeing on the news, it's like going to the theater. What you see going on, you know, what you see going on on the stage is all well rehearsed and well planned. And all of the real work took place backstage. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, it's one of those things like, I mean, the the the, the lack of deep knowledge. I mean, we have all these campaign disclosures. I know you've probably covered it in previous um, podcasts. But I mean, like what happened with uh, Matt Gertler's race against against uh David Ralston and Nathan Deal. Wait, I mean against Mickey Cummings. I mean, it's right. the same thing. That's what was going on. But yeah, he might as well have been running against David Ralston. I mean, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and Gertler ended up beating Ralston and Deal. And but but everyone was. But the thing is, most people don't don't know that. And then you have the same thing with Ken Pullen beating apparently even more people than that when he beat Johnny Caldwell because uh, that was beating an incumbent who was on two powerful committees. But people don't. I mean, people don't realize these narratives. It, like most people probably say, oh, well, if Ralston and Deal are supporting someone, they must be a good Republican. And it's like, well, not so no. much. Yeah, they, they don't run the party. I mean, technically, the person running the party is is John Watson, but he doesn't say anything about these these issues because, you know, he makes money off of it. But what? That, <laughs> imagine that the, the chairman of the state party owns a lobbying firm that gave to the democratic party of georgia before, right before trump got elected i mean these things happen and people always are appalled when i mention them unless they're like you and already know it like it's it's so weird that that exists but if you don't know it you actually trust the politicians what's going on with gra lately well, um, we keep growing. We keep getting people involved. We keep being a, a, a growing force with different chapters around the state. I don't know if we're up to nine or ten now, but we're we're just trying to, to raise money for the, the pack to give money to endorse candidates like um, Ken Pullen and Gertler, who we supported. Um, we endorsed Josh McCoon in the the um, in the primary. Sadly, he did not win that for secretary of state. I still support Josh because. Well, I mean, our members endorse him like 90 something percent, and he's actually principled and calls out these uh, these terrible things going on in government. But surprisingly, he didn't get much news coverage during the the primary election. He got a ton beforehand for standing up for conservative issues, but then it suddenly just disappeared during the primary. I wonder I wonder how that works. Who are you supporting in that race now? Uh, well, I mean, the the joke I, I've responded, but not really a joke, but I say Josh McCoon. And it's funny because, we're, well, you know, Josh McCoon isn't running. But here's the thing. My support, I'm not going to support people who bought their way into a, a run. Amen. I mean, because I mean, think about it, like like I will I will vote for one of them in a general election. I mean, I'll vote for the Republican and I'll, I'll probably I might vote for one of them in the primary. But ultimately, I find it very interesting how most people in the political industry they, they always jump from one person to another. I saw people who are never Trumpers who, as soon as they got a job with Trump, were like, oh, yes, we, we want Trump to win. I'm like, you obviously have no loyalty or, or principle. principle. And, yeah, and I think that that's what we need to remember is that this isn't a team sport. This isn't a game. I mean, if you support someone on principle, you don't turn around and say, oh, well, shucks, they lost. So therefore, you know, I'm going to give my full throated 100 percent like out of the soul endorsement to somebody who bought their way into an election and highly likely may lose to a Democrat. Like it, it makes no sense. I mean, you, you know, like I, I don't, I don't want to reward bad behavior by supporting people who don't deserve it. People have to earn your support. You don't just give it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, and as president of the GRA, I, I sort of, I really like it because ultimately I can't take a side in a primary unless the, RA endorses and generally speaking they've done a good job so far and you know the members themselves make up their mind I don't influence them at all and and you know they they tend to make good decisions and I think they'll make even better ones as we get processes in place one thing that that, that gets me is that I think that it's sort of interesting how vehemently people support 
these these like these candidates as if they can do no wrong. I mean, ultimately, in, in my mind, it's like, look, if I hear bad things about politicians, I assume I generally assume that they are are true unless I have some reason not to. And I generally think of politicians as less like credible than anybody else in society, like just until they prove otherwise. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's extreme or radical, but I mean, that's just my viewpoint. And for some reason, sometimes people look at it the exact opposite. They they assume, you know, that, you know, their guy is 100 percent better than the other guy. And I'm like, well, you know, they're both probably pretty bad and one's a little bit better than the other. Yeah, and that, that's really the way that you have to look at it. Oh, I mean, I had a weird situation where one of our um, back during the primary where uh the DeKalb Republican Assembly, one of the local chapters, hosted a debate for um, governor. And two of the candidates, and, and I think our members would say, probably the more conservative candidates, responded saying they'd go. And then at the last minute, um, our, I mean, according to our president of the DeKalb Republican Assembly, um, one of the candidates, Hunter Hill, like, just decided not to come and dropped out at the last minute. And, you know, he called him out on it, like the president of the RA did. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden, it was like people were saying, oh, well, well, you know, your your guy's lying. Like it's all it's all a sham. Like it's all a, a hit job by Michael Williams. And I was like, this is. It was just surprising that all of a sudden people assumed that that an organization was trying to bias an election when you know it was their guy who just chose not to make a debate. You know, a, a guy who was a member of the Republican Assembly. Like Michael Williams and Hill were both members, and right. suddenly you know we were evil for for. Um, you know, just pointing out that a candidate ditched Didn't the debate. Show up. Yeah, I mean, sort of like what happened with you, I think, that time, Jessica, with uh, Clay Tippin's team canceling on you at the last minute, and then things they didn't going. They make viral. that mistake twice, did they? <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. And, and it has been quite a quite a week uh, with all on Georgia and the Kegel campaign as well. Uh, Two shocking uh, revelations came forth. Uh, first of all, we we learned that All on Georgia is a part of the Kemp campaign. That that came from. The, actually, no, I shouldn't say that because that wasn't an AOG piece. Jessica well, it wasn't is an a part. Of Kemp. AOG piece. Oh, it was okay. Mm -hmm. I I didn't see it on AOG. I just saw it on your personal blog. Okay. And well, then. Leave there. Why did it leave AOG? <laughs> it's still up. It's just. <laughs> but then, uh, secondly, we learned that uh, Casey Cagle will not sit down for a one on one with Jessica because she's interviewed Clay Tippins too many times. Twice. Once when he was running for governor, and once to talk about the Cagle tapes. And we've only had like three people reach out to the camp or the Cagle campaign over a. Mm, I don't know. Nine month period, literally, and he refuses. So, so I mean that, that that's the thing is that, that yeah, and that's the thing is that they, that's their standard operating procedure trying to claim someone's biased when they're afraid of them or they want to hurt their credibility. I mean, I remember when I shared the fact that Tippins ditched on Jessica. I was suddenly um, on the. I think I was either on the take or part of the establishment. And I remember just thinking like that's. That's beautiful. Like I obviously am supporting the establishment candidates. Like it, it's weird. Um, and I think more people need to understand those type of games because otherwise they'll fall for them. They'll believe things like that. Absolutely. I, I absolutely agree. So yeah, it's a, there's been quite a lot going on. Things just breaking in a hurry. Oh, and I, I have a personal bone to pick with you, Jessica. Since your comments last week, I have mm -hmm. other people who are now tagging me in these stupid videos, these stupid <laughs> lip sync challenge videos. That's right. If anyone is listening and you feel so compelled no. to share the joy, make sure you tag Jonathan, send them to his email. That's douglas at allongeorgia.com. And share them personally to his timeline. Um, that's the best way to get it in front of him. No, so please. I do not want to share see lip any lip sync challenge. videos. Oh, the police lip sync videos? Yes. Ah, all right. He loves them. hates them. 
Yeah. Where are you at on these, Alex? I've I've only seen a couple. I mean, I've I've actually just been so busy ever since the rainbow stuff st- started happening. I've been even more busy than than normal. So I've I've had very little time to see what's going on in social media. Usually, I just post something that angers everybody, and then and then don't get Walk to. Away. Yeah, exactly. Like things, things like, oh yeah, the U.S. government loves uh, has historically meddled in the elections of other countries, and I just post it factually. I don't, I don't even take a side on it, and all of a sudden, everyone's up in arms over, you know, historical fact. Welcome to our world. So that's that's the question I have for you all. Is I mean, I, I love what you guys do um, with this and all on Georgia. But wh- how has your reception been? I mean, I love all the articles, which makes me think that there must be a huge number of people who just it ruins their their world to you I'm know have constantly, constantly being nominated for awards. I get flowers on a daily basis. Um, Those are from me. Free meals. Yeah, people are people love. Our work especially the elected ones if they've taken an oath of support they're just they're basically begging for us to come to their community <laughs> so overall i'd say it's going pretty well mm. so you walk in and they all run and like pull out tasers <laughs> <laughs> not the actual cops but the elected officials i think well you had an actual cop throw you out of reedsville one time didn't you no. Oh, that was that just was elected city. officials. Oh, yeah. It was a city attorney. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, all right, then. How do you feel about public land, Alex? Do you think the federal government should own and have in a trust or however you want to phrase it? How do you feel about public land? Wait. Huh? What was that? It, what, you're getting drug into a, a long thing because... Because Matt's a socialist. Because philosophically, I'm I'm an anarchist, but I uh, I like to to do a, I hunt and fish a lot, and I do a lot of it on public land, and because it's something that is that is unique to us here in America, like I'm a fan of it. So it's I, I refer to it as my as my island of socialism in my sea of anarchy, and Jessica likes to mess with me about it. Quite oh, bit. point out that, that that eventually that leads to socialism. I mean, yeah, the the thing is, is that I, I'm torn because I haven't given it a ton of thought because I, I don't see it changing soon. But like last weekend, I actually went caving. Like I went, went like going into a cave. Like I've, I've never done it before. I Somebody taught me, a friend taught me, and we went out and a group of us, like 10 people. And apparently this this conservatory just private it's private and it owns these caves and of course there are some caves on public land in various it places was private wait 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 wait. yes it was wow what a concept i know and that's the thing that, that that draws draws me into the concept of like well you know we have all this public land but look at the things that happen like the wildlife refuge up in Amen. in oregon where jason patrick was arrested for a while and and it will in jail for a while because of all that just being there and, and ultimately these type of situations wouldn't happen if you know you actually just said well wait a second states i mean state i mean if we had pu- public land that was owned by the states at least there you have the state's right side of things and it addresses yeah. the concern of of um of matt matt because you know i mean states have can have public land if they want but why should the federal government be giving all these people pensions and and you know spending all this money to you know harass people on public land i mean again the rainbow issue wouldn't have happened if you didn't have what i've heard half a million dollars going to a a department chasing them around right. the country on i mean it's federal money like it's yeah i mean i guess that's my position on public land is that well i mean if states do it it's it's probably i mean that would be much better than the feds doing it i think the federal government just is a big old piggy bank for everyone's special little interests well you're correct in that assessment and what it is is and they've tried it um one of the things that they do out west is called a state land board and that's how they fund their public school system is through there so 
early on they figured out they sh- they can't do that anymore because the states get broke and they sell off the land. So, like, if you go looking for public <laughs> land in say the state of Texas, you're not going to find it because they sold it all, right? <laughs> but so what it is, it, it amounts to the fact that states cannot afford to own public land because they can't they can't afford to fight the fires that end up on it. They could afford it if you redirected the federal funds back to the states. And, and part of it is... It doesn't matter at that point. Because, because the way that, the, the way that it's currently government. set up is the, gov- the federal government just holds it in trust. But all of the laws on it are all, are all state laws. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There are federal laws that prohibit, that, that govern our, our national parks and things like that. Yes, national parks, but not national forests, things like that. Well, but you told us well, last okay. week that there are multiple facets of public land. Yes, there are. There's national parks, national refuge, wildlife refuge, fisheries, uh, national forest. And um, there are federal regulations that cover all of those, right? There, I mean, are, there are some, but like when it comes to when it comes to a lot of hunting and fishing and camping and things like that, that's all state. There's very yeah, but it's. You can pee in public in a state park and it's a misdemeanor and you can pee in a, a national park and it's a felony. And even if it was a misdemeanor, that would probably mean you end up not getting a jury trial because they have a whole petty offense statute with federal crimes. And so, hey, speaking of peeing in parks and federal regulations, let's talk about some hookers. specifically wasn't this, wasn't this on a previous podcast like the hooker discussion no no this is a different hooker discussion oh, we actually about hookers with Catherine. yeah 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 well actually we, we talked about hookers and uh stormy daniels with Catherine. Catherine was gonna join matt and i at the uh at the pink pony to uh to see stormy daniels and she was arrested in ohio so the charges were dropped but uh, anyway, the, no, actually, what I'm referring to here is uh, is the uh, SESTA, FOSTA, which is, uh, that's basically the law that, I'm not going to get into all the nuts and bolts of it, but it's, because it's some techie nerd stuff, but basically that's the law that shut down Backpage, uh, which is a, you know, one of the premier, like, Craigslist, it's like, Craigslist, but it's used like 75% for hookers. And uh, it also shut down the adult section of Craigslist because basically it was a it was a federal law that states that if you own a website where child sex trafficking occurs, you can be charged under that. Um, but anyway, uh, Backpage has been shut down since April. And now uh, police in Indianapolis are claiming that that the back page shutdown has made their jobs more difficult because they are now having to catch the hookers the old fashioned way. <laughs> Through police work? Yes. Wow. <laughs> that's priceless. I mean that's yeah, I mean, and, and that's part of our problem is that the, the, the that oftentimes law enforcement now, it's like, it, it's almost like it's a game to try to go and arrest as many people as possible instead of trying to arrest people that actually are harmful to society. You know, like, it's it's weird to me that, that they just, they want to make it easy to get as many citations as possible. Well, all right, Alex. Well, we certainly do appreciate you coming on with us this week. Well, I, I I really I really enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoy talking to people who you know are knowledgeable about this stuff and are sick well, of. I, I enjoy hearing people who understand that public land is not the proper role of government. So I appreciate your commentary on that. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, and just to to extend it slightly, is that think about it? If you if you say that oh yeah, states would go broke. I mean, that just shows the states are incompetent in a way and need to have better representation and the feds i mean they're already going broke i mean we're all going broke with the national debt if we keep spending money that doesn't doesn't exist so 
I think I think that just supports your argument, Jessica. It's all a stepping stone towards socialism and and statism from the Fed. Sorry, Matt. No, that's all right. I mean, that's kind of where we left it. I was like, you know, ultimately she's right. But we got a lot of other things to worry about before we worry about my two billion. And hey, on the bright side, if everything goes into some violent conflict, we have public land to go to because there are a lot of forests, places to hide. I mean, the Rainbow family probably will know all the, the best ways to survive if, you know, cities run out of money. Well, I mean, look, in one of those types of scenarios, I don't know if you've ever studied that stuff, but one of the things that I, I've got a friend who studies disaster scenarios and what about for the military, and it's like, it's something ridiculous. Everyone's like, oh, I'll just go hunt. You know, four months in, you're eating rats and cats and your dog because yeah. everything else is gone. All right, and on that note, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Be yeah, you know, every, every week we close the show with a closing thought. So, Alex, we'll we'll start with you since you're the guest here. Do you have any closing thoughts for the week? Just on anything doesn't have to be anything we've even discussed. Um, I think that I th I think that people need to start asking themselves if they really care about what they see in the media or if they care about it because of the media. Wow, that's a uh, that is that is that's far profound. more yeah that's far more profound and retrospective than the usual closing thoughts. I would just like to say to everyone, stop sharing these stupid lip sync videos <laughs> on my timeline. Tagging you and every one of them, Jessica. Um, I just like to formally request um the comment that Matt made that I was right, I'd like to put that on loop. I'll, I'll email that over to you. <laughs> which, speaking of which, uh, you, you'll notice there is no loser of the week poll this week. You know why that is, Jessica? You didn't why? DM me. You <laughs> did not DM me on Instagram. Matt? Uh, uh, let's see. My concluder will be... You know, I, I've... I told our listeners to call their federal their, their congressman and urge them to uh, tell them to vote yes to fully fund the LWCF. Now I want them to urge them to vote no on the amendments for the LWCF. And it's public land stuff, so I won't bore y'all with the details. All right. Well, thank you very much.